Oh, so, so Mother Lisa and, and Matthew, how is this Easter? It's not it's boring. It's very boring. I can't see my friends anymore. And I can't go outside. And no school. Boring. And I can't see my doggy. The door what? is done, maybe. Wait, wait. What are, what are you going to do for Easter Sunday? We might going to do an Easter hunt. Or me and Sydney and Matthew's going to bake a cake for Easter. And then we can eat it together as a family. Mm-hmm. So he's going to make an Easter. Easter supper, whatever that is now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then she, we can maybe have Easter hunt. We don't know yet. Well. And what do yeah. you think about what do you think about uh, Easter and Jesus? So, Easter is because of Jesus rose again from the dead. Yeah. That's yeah. All I what do you say, Betty? <laughs> and the friends came to saw him, but the club was open. Oh. Okay. Thank you. I like palms and Easter eggs. Mally, how is Easter different this year? Well, because we're all on lockdown, it's there's not going to be a lot of people out, and we're going to have to do a lot of things inside, and it's not going to be the same as normal. And what is the best thing for you about Easter? Well, that's Jesus, the fact that Jesus rose again and is still alive. And what do you think you're going to do today, Easter Sunday? I think that we'll go on lots of Easter egg hunts inside and we'll find lots of cool things. How do we celebrate Easter? Easter is a reminder of that Jesus died and sacrificed his life for our sins. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus died for us and he brought peace amongst all people. Okay, Amy. Um, I was wondering, how do you think Jesus' friends felt after he had died on the cross, but before he had risen? Well... Mary, the one that got really, really sad when he had risen, um, he he went to the garden and he thought it was a gardener, but it was actually Jesus. So, so what I really think to that question is quite tricky. Mm. Um, well, I think that. They felt really, really sad, and they thought that Jesus would never come alive again. They were wrong. So my answer for my first question I did was, he just can't, he can't stay there and not love us. He has to love us again um, in different circumstances. So, um... That's what I think it is, really. Um, that's why. That's answer to my question. What is the best thing about Easter for you? Jesus dying on the cross to save us, my sins, and the Easter egg and the Easter bunny. What do you like best about Easter? Um, Easter eggs and Easter eggs and Jesus died on the cross. Good morning, everyone. It's Easter Sunday. Happy Easter. Woo! Everybody wave and say happy Easter. Happy Easter. <laughs> we want to welcome you here to our service this morning. And we really pray that the Spirit is with you where you find yourself this morning. And to start with, we want to hand you over to Rose. Happy Easter. I really want to wish all those families who are watching a really super fun Easter day. We know that real happiness and joy comes from knowing Jesus. And I really pray that you have that spirit of joy and happiness in your homes today, this Easter time. It does feel a bit different, doesn't it guys? This Easter, we're in our homes and we can't meet together but it was so nice to hear from all of you guys just now 
about the things that you're looking forward to today and that you like enjoying and celebrating at Easter. We're celebrating that Jesus is alive. He's alive now, here, today. And that's why Christians have such a big deal and such a big celebration at Easter. This week, we've been remembering the story about Jesus coming into Jerusalem, where he was eating his last meal with his friends, his disciples. He went to preach in the temple. And he washed the feet of his disciples and he prayed in the garden and eventually he was taken to the cross where he died and i hope that you've really enjoyed opening your easter packets each day to follow along with that story and, and you've been able to discuss that and pray through some of the things with your grown-ups well we saw in the end that jesus died but that isn't the end of the story the cross is not the end of the story today we celebrate that Jesus became alive again, that God raised Jesus from the dead. When we think about all the bad stuff in our world today and the difficulties that we sometimes face, we can also know that they are not the end of the story. They don't have to be, there's more. The power that raised Jesus from the dead is with us today. Jesus offers us hope, and he offers to be with us from all that life throws at us. If you want to know more about what this amazing Easter power is all about, we've made a little YouTube video. And so you might like to watch that after this or at some point today. And you can think more about what Easter really means and how the death of Jesus on the cross and his rising again and al being alive again can really give us hope and joy today so we want to praise god together and we want to celebrate this rich tradition and this amazing love and power that we have in jesus and we're going to praise god together jill thank you hello from the marston family i'm jill hello. i'm jake i'm holly let's um sing together in christ alone Thank you. 
Thank you, Jill. <laughs> Good day, everybody. Happy Easter, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to read a psalm. Uh, I will read from Psalm 118, verses 14 until verse 24. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Souts of joy in, and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done many mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and, pro and proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he was not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you've answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone that builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ronald, um, for that reading. I'm going to hand over to Lynn Fretos, who's been uh, working at, uh, at the Red Cross during this time. And she's going to just lead us, share something of, of what she's been doing and lead us in some prayers for those who are um, working as essential workers at the moment. Hi, everyone. Um, most of you know me. Um, I just thought I'd share a little bit about what it's like out there, because so many of you are at home and living in a very small circle between the home and maybe the shopping center, and that's about it. Um, so I thought I'd just let you know a little bit of what's happening in the hospitals and what's happening with um, all the preparations that are being made. And certainly at Red Cross Hospital, and I think at the other government hospitals and the private hospitals, there's been a huge amount of preparation and reorganization going on. Um, there's been whole areas restructured and reformulated. They're ripping up carpets and putting down vinyl. Um, they're moving staff around, they're moving the ways that they're doing things so that um, they can handle both the infected and the non-infected pa patients. Um, these big tents gone up in the, in the parking areas for triage and testing. Um, there's a lot of training going on at all levels. So training from porters to cleaning staff to cooking staff, um, physios, radiographers, everyone's receiving training. Um, and there's a lot of protocols and guidelines being drawn up. Uh, there's a lot of webinars going on with the specialist staff. They, they're consulting almost daily with international experts and um, people all around the world, getting their advice and putting new things into place. So I think there's a huge amount of preparation going on. There's plans for the future that if, if needed, there will, be, um, there will be links between public and private and cooperation and staff will be moved and there'll be volunteers brought in. So I think the medical services that I can see so far have really done their best in getting everything ready. At the same time, the hospitals are dead quiet as far as patients go. There's no outpatients hardly. Um, and so there's very few people, only the most essential services are carrying on, um, emergency services and those that have to be seen. Um, as far as the staff go, I would say that the general mood is of apprehension, um, but also determination that people are, they're not sure what they're facing, but they are ready to face what is coming. There's been quite a lot of anxiety, particularly amongst the non-medical staff, the porters and um, those staff. But they, I think with training, they've become more confident in what they're doing and how they're going to manage. It, it feels almost like the, the essential services have been girding up for battle and like we're standing there now already, ready for the onslaught, but not quite sure when it is coming or how it is coming. So that's where we are now. And so, I would really like to just lead us in some prayer for all those who are providing essential services. I think the main fear of everyone who is out in public areas, the, the police, the, um, the drivers, the shopkeepers, the people at the tills, I think everyone's fear is that they will, they will bring infection into their homes. So it's really um, a cry that we would, we would be protected and that we would be able to carry on our work, I think, as we carry on. So let's just lead, be led in a time of prayer, if that's okay. Psalm 23 verse four says, even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. 
your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So, Father, we thank you for your presence with us at this time and for your promise that you will never leave us. We thank you today for our leaders and for our health professionals who are preparing for this storm in every way that they can. Thank you that they can learn from other countries and for the willing collaboration and sharing of knowledge across the world. Thank you for all those who are providing the essential services, the police, the medical services, the shops, the transport, the factories that are open. Lord, we pray for your protection over all those working in public areas. And we pray, Lord, that you will release those folk from fear, give them adequate rest, and preserve their strength and mental health. Please give us good leadership and good teamwork, good communication in all essential services. Lord, we pray too for all those around the world who are ill and for those who are bereaved. We bring before you those countries that are suffering terribly at the moment, including China and the US, Britain and Europe. And we pray for their leaders and medical teams and essential services. We pray for those countries that have very few resources to cope with this pandemic. And we think especially of Africa. And we ask you, Lord, to spare them in your mercy. Above all, Lord, we pray that in our homes, in our workplaces and in our communities, we will treat each other with kindness and compassion. Let us always treat others as we would like to be treated. We pray, Lord, that there won't be victimization or, or exclusion of those that, that get infected. We just pray, Lord, that we will stand together in ourselves, in our country, and in the world as we, as we fight this disease. And Lord, we thank you again that you are present with us we offer these prayers in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.
Thank you, Jill and the Marsdens. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, um, we thank you that you reign. Uh, we want to declare you as King and as Lord of our lives, Father God, and as Lord of our world, um, even in the midst of uh, some of the challenges that we face at the moment. Father God, I pray that as we turn to your word now, Lord, um, and remember your uh, resurrection, your coming to life, and that life that we can find in you, Lord, that you give us open hearts to hear from you and to respond to you, Lord. I pray that you'd guide and direct my words, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone. It's quite weird doing this online thing, all these different bits and pieces coming together. So we've, we've more or less managed so far. I'm praying for the rest that it'll, it'll go well. Um, uh, I'm going to share um, from a passage of Scripture now, um, and then uh, Brian is going to be sharing as we look at the Lord's Supper um, shortly after this as well. So I do want to just wish you a very happy Easter. Um, even in the midst of this lockdown, we say Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Um, and we give thanks as we remember this day um, that three days after Jesus um, had been crucified on the cross, three days after all had seemed lost, three days after the disciples had turned away in despair, thinking, where is this all going? It seems like all is lost. They came to the tomb and they discovered that Jesus was no longer there. He had been raised to life and he was alive. He was no longer dead and in the tomb. And I really pray that as we celebrate that resurrected King today, we would know something of God's and Jesus's resurrection power at work in our own lives um, and in our communities, and that we would be empowered to be witnesses of that in the places that God has called us to. I'm gonna be reading today, the reading comes from um, Acts 10, from verses 34 to um, 43. Um, and it's uh, before we read it, just to give you some context, this is um, from the beginning of chapter 10 of Acts. This is the um, account of uh, Cornelius and Peter. And we have Cornelius was a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. And um, he was a Roman, um, one of the enemies, strictly speaking. Um, but he was someone who was described as someone who was uh, God-fearing. He prayed and he gave to the poor. And so he was respected by the Jews. I think that's, wouldn't that be an amazing thing to be someone who's known as someone who prays and is generous? And that's what Cornelius was known as. And God appeared to him in a vision at three in the afternoon. I love that detail of three in the afternoon. Um, God, uh, an angel came and appeared to him. In a vision and said, go and fetch this man um, who's down in Joppa, staying with Simon the Tanner. And so he sends some men down there um, to fetch Peter. Um, and Peter the next day had been praying um, up on the roof and he got hungry, as one does when you pray a lot. And um, we see that uh, uh, he also has this, this vision where this, this um, sort of tablecloth, this cloth is let down full of unclean animals. When God says, eat, and he says, no, I won't. Um, and then uh, God says, there's some guys coming to your door. Please go with them. And it's a whole precursor here as, as God is opening the way um, for the Gentiles to be included in the kingdom. So there's two parallel stories happening here. The one is of how God speaks through Cornelius and his family to Peter and to the church. Um, about that the salvation is not just for the Jews and for the Jewish nation, but actually something that's extended to all the nation, pick, nations picking up on Abraham's promise. Um, and then secondly, so that's the first story. And then the second story in it is of how God is reaching into Cornelius and his family in the midst of this, and how he speaks through Peter into that man's life. And that's the bit that we're going to focus on today in this particular passage. Um, that we're going to be reading. So let me read to you here from Acts 10, verse 34 to 43. Please do, if you've got a Bible with you, follow along um, with me as well. Then Peter began to speak. Now I realize how true it is. This is just as he's arrived in Cornelius' home. Peter then began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and um, does what is right. 
you know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God has appointed as judge of the living and the dead. And all the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness through his name. So these are, I love this because it's a very simple passage in many ways. Um, and for me, it's a picture of Peter simply coming as a witness. That's all he is. He's seen some things and he comes and he shares about those things with the people that God has brought before him. Verse 34 and 36, um, he talks about how God accepts those from every nation who fear him and do what is right, laying the foundation for the inclusion of the Gentiles um, into this. In verse 37 and 38, he goes on to say, you know, it's common knowledge what has happened. You guys know what's happened. People are aware of this. There was John the Baptist. Then God anointed Jesus with power, and he healed, and he saved, and he redeemed those under the enemy's power. He did all these miraculous things. And then in verse 39, he goes on to say, we are witnesses of everything Jesus did in Jerusalem. And for me, that verse 39 is so key because I believe that God is reminding us again to be witnesses to what he has done um, in our lives and in the world. This is what Peter was a witness to. He was a witness to the fact that Jesus was killed by hanging him on a cross. He's a witness of the fact that God then raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen by many of his followers. He's a witness of the fact that he was amongst those who, was, who Jesus was then revealed to. He actually ate and drank and ate with Jesus after he had been risen from the dead. It wasn't just a story he heard from somewhere else. This was something he had known and he had seen with his own eyes. He had spoken with his master and he had shared a meal together with them. No one could deny that. No one could take that away. That was the reality of the situation. And he says, Jesus then commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one who God has appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Jesus meets with them. They're a witness to that. And as part of that witness, he's saying, he spoke to us and said, you go now and preach to the people and testify, be witnesses to what you have known of me, that I will be the judge of the living and the dead. It's the same thing that the prophets testify about that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins through his name. And that is the hope we celebrate at Easter time and on this Easter Sunday, the hope that we have of the forgiveness of sins through the name of Jesus. So there are two, there's lots we can focus on in this passage, but I'm wanting to focus on two things. Um, the first is that I really believe that God is calling us to be witnesses of the reality of who he is. We are called to be witnesses. That's the first thing. And then secondly, that we would know something of his resurrection power in our lives, that that would be real, not just something we've heard about or others have shared about, but something that's real to us. The thing about being a witness is it's something that we have seen or we have heard. Uh, I feel so with the social media stuff going on and all the fake news, um, so much of what there is out there is, um, is the, the, the fake news or stuff that we have heard that someone else said that they were passed on to by Joe's uncle's brother's cousin-in-law who had heard this and then shared it and then we share it on. And I think sometimes there's a danger 
that we can live our faith almost vicariously through others. How do you know Jesus? What are you a witness of? Sometimes we go, yeah, well, because I, I heard about that person who was healed, or I know that he did that person and that person over there's life. They've got an amazing testimony. Ronald, who read earlier the passage to us, has an amazing testimony of God turning his life around from being a gangster and, uh, and being addicted to drugs to be someone who was set free from the power of those things. And I feel sometimes, ooh, what's my testimony? <laughs> it feels a bit boring in some ways in comparison. But I do have my own experience of knowing the reality and the power of Christ at work in my life. And I want to challenge you today. What is your story of your encounter with the risen Christ? How have you known him and his work in your life? And it's that story that we need to be free to share with others and to those around us. I was so encouraged a while ago, we had a, a, a pastorate meeting and uh, it was a very simple time, but one of the things we did was just share how we came to know Jesus. And there were some people there who I'd known for a long time, but who I never knew the story of how they had come to faith. And there were some beautiful stories of people sharing simply of how they had encountered this risen Lord who was no longer dead, but was alive. And that power had helped transform their lives. I pray that you would know the power of that. I pray that if you do not know that in some ways, that, that you would encounter Jesus in a new way this Easter that would transform and change things for you um, and that you would be able to share that message with others. So what are we witnesses of and how have we known God's resurrection power? I was reading, for me, that's what this whole story of Peter is about. Um, is that he is spreading, and this is how the gospel spread through the world. There's, there's simple stories of someone like Peter going into Cornelius' home and sharing the story of what they have seen and heard. And then the spirit comes in and does the rest. Um, the book I was reading recently, uh, Writings of the New Testament by uh, Luke Timothy Johnson, and he spoke about the spread of Christianity um, uh, early on, just after Jesus. And he said that the key to its success lay not in its teaching, but in its experience of power. The key to its success lay not in its teaching, but in its experience of power. It actualized the good news of God to humans and is able to spread by making plausible and persuasive claims. For me, that's something that's so true, is that we don't simply like mentally go, yeah, this is a set of beliefs and chi teachings that seems like a good idea. And we say yes to those. Faith is so much more than that. It's about an experience of God's redeeming power in our lives. He goes on in the book to build this beautiful case for um, of a resurrected Christ, and he calls it a resurrection faith. But that's the picture of what we see of, um, of Jesus in such a powerful way. And we see it through all the early generations. There's a similar pattern there of people who aren't just agreeing with some teaching, but they have encountered the risen Jesus. And he said there's some very clear effects every time. People are suddenly released from the perceptions of the age and from the powers and principalities that everyone thinks, oh, this is how it does. They are released from that. They escape fear of death. Um, it's something that they are not as concerned about anymore because they have a greater hope. They experience freedom. They experience freedom in speech and boldness. They experience a peace. And the amazing thing is that peace is not in the place of comfort. I feel like as a church, we often have faith in God from a place of comfort where it's comfortable and safe. These people in the early church had faith and peace and joy in the midst of suffering and challenge, in the midst of persecution and pestilence and plague, in the, in the, in the presence of so much hardship. They knew peace and they knew joy and it was rooted in the experience of the risen God. And faith, hope and love flowed out from that. These things were fundamental to the experience that shaped the Christian movement. And I believe that they should be fundamental to us today still as that Christ Christian movement continues to grow um, as God is at work among us. And that's what we see in this simple encounter um, in Acts, um, uh, the, 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 the author uh, Johnson goes on to say, Christianity is not a religion of mystical enlightenment, enlightenment, 
but rather begins with Jesus followers experiencing Jesus in a new way after his death. A religion of a personal counter of encountering the other in Jesus. And I really want to just encourage us with those two things today. I want to pray that you would know the power of the resurrected Christ in your life. Um, if you already know that, that's awesome and that's wonderful. Then please share, share that with others. How is God calling you to be a witness? We can be witnesses even when we're still stuck at our homes. We are a witness in the way that we talk and we share online, in the way that we reflect, hopefully, a joy and a peace which is different to the world around us in our engagement with others. And we share something of the story of why we believe what we do. So I pray, and I want to pray that if you do not know, um, to have that experience of the risen power of the resurrected Lord in your life, that you would seek that out. I want to encourage all of us, and it's very simple, just go into your room, get down on your knees, if your knees are <laughs> able enough to manage it, and pray. Turn to the Lord and say, Lord, I need you. Would you guide me and lead me? And if we don't know where to pray, pick up the Bible and read, read those scriptures, pray those scriptures. And bring yourself to the Lord and say, Lord, I'm not too sure what to pray, but guide me and lead me in your ways. And I trust and I believe that you would encounter God in a new way in those places. And it would be from that personal experience of his power and his reality that he would free us up to live for him in a way that's different to the world around us. And that's what equips us to be witnesses, because we then have something to be witnesses about. Otherwise, we're just sharing other people's stories. And to not forget to be witnesses. So go to your room and pray and pray and pray and seek the Lord. I pray that you would know him with power in a new way this Easter. And I pray that God would equip us to be witnesses, both practically and in our prayers. And as we chat to people who are in need and as we respond to some of the physical needs around us, to the appeals and the economic challenges that we face, that we would be a people who are witnesses of this resurrection faith, of a resurrected Jesus and of the good news, of the forgiveness of sins that's to be found in him. I'm going to pray for us now, um, and then I'm going to hand over to Brian. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are with us by your Holy Spirit. Even as we are just watching a service online and trying to take part in this, that you are here. And I want to pray for your presence with each one of us in a powerful way, Lord God, over this Easter, that we would encounter you in new ways, Lord. I pray that you would breathe life and fire into our prayers. And I pray that we would be witnesses, Father God, of all that we encounter. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brendan. It's a very special weekend in the life of the church. Beginning on the Thursday evening, when Jesus sat down with the twelve, and celebrated the Passover and gave it a new meaning. He was the Lamb of God who was slain. And his body and blood uh, are what we remember in communion. We remember the events of Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Jesus is now the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Sunday became the day that Christians met because it was the resurrection day. They met and rejoiced in Jesus being alive. And so Sunday is a good day to have communion together. But the early Christians also had communion in their homes. So I encourage you, as you see this strange form of communion now, to do the same in your home if you can. To look forward to the day when the shutdown is finished and you can have communion in groups. And to look forward to that day when we come together and celebrate on a Sunday again communion. So there's a very simple communion which I'm going to do. And you can all do it in your home together. We read from 1 Corinthians 11. I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So we take what Jesus did and follow his example. We take bread and we give thanks. We thank you, Heavenly Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross for us, for rising again on the third day. We thank you for your broken body 
which for our sins and your resurrection body which gives us new life and so having given thanks we broke break the bread and when it's suitable in your home you can do the same and participate in the bread And then carrying on in 1 Corinthians 11, the next verses, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this death, you proclaim the Lord's death. Drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we thank you, Lord, for these vivid symbols, broken bread, wine that is red and reminds us of your blood shed for us. You are the Lamb of God, and through your blood we have a new covenant, a covenant of grace where we freely forgiven and experience your resurrection power. So I invite you, when it's suitable in your home, to do something similar, either if you're alone or with a group of your family, that you break bread and share the cup together. Join together in singing this great Easter hymn, Thine Be the Glory. Thank you. 
right, I'm just sorting out um, where I am over here. Um, we're going to just um, share uh, in the blessing now as we as we close. Um, I don't know, Zane. Actually, if we could maybe do the um, after this, I'm going to share this the, the, this blessing, um, and then we're going to uh, share a short little video, which um, is of the creed, which I think is a, a, an amazing opportunity for us um, together to declare something of the truth of who God is. Um, and I think in the midst of the uncertainty, it's so important that God remains God. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Um, and so after this blessing, Zane's going to um, show that. And please uh, join in with that if you do know the words. Um, so I do just pray for God's blessing on you uh, this Easter and on your families. I know for some of us, we're alone and it's really hard. And for some of us, we've got our whole family around us and it's hard because there are too many people around. Um, for some of us, we're not in but we're out there doing a lot of stuff so we're all in very different places but i pray that you would know god's presence with you in a real and powerful way this day i want to pray this blessing for us may the love of god enfold you the peace of christ hold you the joy of his presence lead you and the blessing of god almighty the father the son and the holy spirit rest upon you and remain with you wherever you are and whatever you face and I pray that you would go now in love to serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried and descended to the dead on the third day he rose again he ascended into heaven he is seated at the right hand of the father and he will come to judge the living and the dead i believe in the holy spirit the holy catholic church the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.